That's portions of the letter. Well, I answered Carol Lister, who wrote that letter. She's regional director of the ADL, by inviting her to appear on Like It Is to confront Dr. Ben. Well, the ADL has accepted, and so has Dr. Ben. We'll get things right underway in a moment. Professor Yosef Ben Yekinen, or Dr. Ben as he is popularly known, is an Egyptologist, the author of innumerable books on African history and Egyptology, and has taught for several years at Cornell University. Rabbi Arthur Seltzer is director of the Long Island Regional Office of the Anti-Defamation League and resides in Great Neck, Long Island. Welcome to Like It Is. Thank you. Maybe we can start with you, Rabbi Seltzer. Uh, did you see the program? No, I did not see the program, but I have studied the transcripts. Okay. How did you come to uh, this chair today? How did that happen, since you didn't see the program? You were called by the New York office of the ADL and made aware of the program? Yes, Carol Lister, who originally wrote to you, very much wanted to appear, but because of a conflict of uh, schedule, yes. uh, she asked if I would uh, assume the responsibility of uh, responding in the name of ADL. All right. And that's what brings me here. And she sent you the transcript? Yes, indeed. All right. What are your problems with the comments that were made by Dr. Ben in, in the program? From the perspective of the ADL, we have numerous difficulties with uh, the statements that were made. Uh, and I suspect we'll have an opportunity as the program goes on to discuss specifics. But in an overall general sense, uh, as we study the transcript, Dr. Ben's remarks uh, were full of clearly factual errors. Uh, but the kind of errors which were not just matters of detail, but were matters that would lead one uh, down the path of the charge of dual loyalty, which, as Carolista indicated in her, le uh, her letter, has been a classic uh, charge of the anti-Semite uh, throughout the generations. The statement uh, that appears in the transcript that was made by uh, Dr. Ben, uh, that a Jewish child uh, makes a statement of allegiance uh, uh, to Israel, uh, and uh, makes a statement of allegiance greater than even to his Americanism is so patently false and outrageous as to make one wonder why such a statement would be made. I must tell you that before uh, joining the staff of the Anti-Defamation League, I served as a congregational pulpit rabbi for nine years and officiated at countless numbers of bar and bat mitzvahs in my congregations. And I must tell you that never have I heard a, a, uh, a more inaccurate statement as to what goes on. Uh, the transcript uh, uh, indicates that uh, a Jewish child uh, commits himself that there shall never be another Holocaust, uh, takes upon himself political obligations, takes upon himself the responsibility to fight for the uh, state of Israel. The reality is that in the Jewish tradition, bar mitzvah means the son of the commandments and a boy becomes a bar mitzvah, a son of the commandments, upon his 13th birthday. A girl, in America, the practice tends to be at 12, according to Talmudic law, she reaches her majority at 12 and a half. The bar mitzvah ceremony most specifically indicates that a Jewish child, a minor, now has reached that stage in life where he is considered an adult Jew in terms of his religious, and communal responsibilities. Any statements that are made of commitment by bar and bat mitzvah uh, children or adults as they enter the adult world in the Jewish community are statements of acceptance of the yoke of the commandments of all that comes with uh, Jewish life, personal, family, uh, communal, and under no circumstances are there statements of political content. But if I could uh, perhaps clarify this a bit more, uh, Dr. Ben then indicated in the uh, uh, transcript, as it appears, that this very statement of loyalty that's made to the state of Israel uh, is the seedbed out of which comes the charge of dual loyalties. Uh, and uh, we ask ourselves in the Anti-Defamation League the following question. Why would anyone offer such a blatantly false and frankly perverse statement of what it means for a Jewish community to celebrate a religious ceremony of passage 
The answer, we might suggest, is the next sentence, which indicates the charge of, of dual loyalties. Uh, this statement was made many, many times throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the, the entire transcript. It led in one of his remarks to a statement in discussing about Israel that uh, now we understand about the genocide of the uh, Hebrews as they entered the land. Uh, the commitment of a Jewish child to fight for Israel reflects the genocidal entrance of the children of Israel uh, into the land in biblical times. Not only does that have a distinctly political ring to it, uh, it is again an unacceptable statement if only from the point of view of biblical scholarship, which very clearly has come to understand uh, that uh, those sections that speak of a victorious march of, a, uh, of, the, of an army of onslaught into the land are certainly later sections of the text edited as kind of national poetry. But if one reads the second book of Samuel in the uh, Bible, one reads very clearly a different version of the immigration of tribes slowly into the land, the entrance into the land, the settlement with other peoples, and indeed a close reading of the text will indicate that even during the times of King David and King Solomon and after, many non-Hebrews lived side by side with the Hebrews in the land. In effect, there was no such genocide, uh, there was no such destruction, and to even raise the thought that a Jewish child uh, indicates his loyalty to the Jewish people in the context of that uh, historical statement and it's applied in terms of the Jewish present mm -hmm. is something that frankly insulting is I think an apt word as far as we understand it. If I may just add one other uh, part to this. Uh, the transcript would indicate that Dr. Ben in his concern for the need in the black community for cultural and ideological structures and unity, which is obviously a laudable and uh, uh, praiseworthy uh, goal, then proceeds to redefine Jewish history and biblical history uh, in a way which may be conducive to his political view, but does violence to history. He refers to uh, Judaism uh, as originating in Africa that all of Judaism comes from Africa. Uh, the reality of the biblical text, one must merely open it to read, is that Abraham comes from Mesopotamia. He comes uh, from the area uh, which we uh, today refer to as the Fertile Crescent. Indeed, what we refer today as Judaism, the religion of the Jewish people, reached its full maturity not in Egypt, but uh, according to many scholars, after the first exile in 586 BCE back into Mesopotamia. The need to rewrite history of other people in order to create a uh, cultural <coughs> superstructure for oneself does neither justice to the one whose uh, history is being rewritten nor the one who pursues the worthy goal of cultural structures. And therefore, to tie it up, we find most disturbing the, the factual uh, mistakes that are replete in this transcript, but of more uh, compelling concern, the ultimate uh, dual loyalty, uh, genocidal, militaristic implications of the state. Genocidal, you say? In the reference to uh, the biblical genocide, so, mm. so it appears in the transcript, that is the term that's used, uh, of the uh, children of Israel uh, as they entered the land. I would certainly not subscribe to such a term. The very fact that it does appear attributed to Dr. Ben in the text, we find to be absolutely, again, insulting and unacceptable. All right. Dr. Ben, what is your response? <clears throat> By the way, I have to let the rabbi know I'm much as a Jew as he is, born of a Jewish mother, a Yemenite a grandmother, a Yemenite Perican mother, a Ethiopian Hebrew uh, father, better Israel, by the way they call us Falasha for whatever their reasons. Thus I am as much a Jew as the rabbi or the grand rabbi in Israel, any of the grand rabbis in Israel. Is the rabbi stating here that in the book of Genesis there is no mention of the extermination, and I use the word genocide, of the seven tribes of K uh, the Amalekites, the Hittites, the Moabites, the Jebusites, he in his own statement stated that this is ameliorated somewhat in the book of Samuel. Everybody saw that. But the book of Samuel doesn't change the book of, uh, of Genesis. 
And we remember that Genesis wasn't written first. It was Exodus. It's at the Council of Jamia that they decided to write Genesis. Next, uh, since there is no Jewish race, you know, you have Indian Jews from India, from Kashim Jews look like any Indian. You have uh, ourselves from Ethiopia. By the way, the rabbi wouldn't forget that it says Moses married the daughter of the high priest of Ethiopia, or Cush. Uh, uh, being a rabbi, he will know this. Uh, second, uh, more over about the Bar Mitzvah, and I went through one like the rabbi went through one at around the same period of time. Is the rabbi saying that the Bar Mitzvah is not a commitment to the people? Isn't the Torah demanding? And I don't talk about the Talmud. Talmud is not Torah. The Torah is supposed to have been written by God or passed down. Although it was, in fact, written at the Sanhedrin, the, the, the theory, the mythology, the allegory is that it's written by God or passed down by Moses, again, is a myth. That's Jewish mythology. Because Moses is, de is dead in around 1196 before the Christian era. Whereas the Sanhedrin doesn't release a thing called the Torah until about 700 before the Christian era, which was written from 700 before the Christian era to 500. It took 200 years. Uh, there's a commitment in anybody that any child that's been by mitzvah, and when you're talking about circumcision of women, that is strictly Western, and it has nothing to do with orthodoxy. They're using the word orthodoxy to mean something. Uh, there have not been a circumcision. It can be a circumcision of young of girls. But anyhow, let us continue. Uh, the point is that in the Bar Mitzvah, it commits the boy. Wait, if you commit yourself to the community, there's a call to return to Israel. There's a call that everyone, every child, I went to it, that you must come back to Israel. If that, if that is not a fact, the rabbi can say what he wants. His, his position of, or the ADL, position of fear of this, then let's look at the behavior. Uh, it's just like saying today, you know, one time the rabbi, I don't know to, uh, personally, but the ADL and all the other Jewish organization, one time didn't even recognize that we exist as Palashas. It is something in America. American Jews have decided that they're going to speak for all Jews, and not only for all Jews. You remember they said blacks and Jews. I could, I'm black and Jewish. You're white and Jewish. You're European. You're of European Jewish uh, ancestry. I'm an African Jewish ancestry. No more claim to Israel than I have, because there's no Jewish race. Okay, let me continue. The rabbi forget, he says that Abraham, he points to Judaism coming from Abraham. Then I said that the rabbi obviously have not read the Ten Commandments and their source. The ten, Moses is not until about 1346 before the Christian era, 49 years after the death of Amenhotep IV, otherwise known as Akhenaten. Every one of those 12 so-called commandments and uh, that Moses is supposed to have gotten at Mount Sinai. By the way, Mount Sinai is still in Egypt, in Africa. Hasn't gone any place. Now, those 10 commandments weren't gotten by, by Moses. I, because I'm Jewish, don't mean that I have to listen to, I have to follow the mythology. When you go in any of the major tombs in Egypt, you find those 10 commandments plus 32 more otherwise referred to as the negative confession. Am I to believe that Moses was born in, 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 in Mizraim, Egypt, about 1346 before the Christian era, went to school there, uh, become a priest, at age 85 or around there, decided that somebody mistreated his people, and that it, it, in every school in Egypt, you had to recite the negative confession, 42 laws of which they said, I have not killed man or woman. I have not stolen this. I have not, every one of the so-called Ten Commandments is already stated that Moses didn't see it. I would like the rabbi to tell me, where does it show that Abraham taught any of this? I would like the rabbi to tell me, before circumcision in Egypt, where did the Jews have circumcision? They said that Abraham's circumcision is part of what made him uh, a Jewish. Then the rabbi must tell me, the worship of the golden calf, which they call the golden calf, is not the worship of Hathor, the goddess Hathor. We could go on down. Well, before we go on, Dr. Ben, let me just intrude. We do need to take a commercial break. Uh, we'll pause for a breath, and we'll return right after this. This is Dr. Ben that was voiced by Rabbi Selta, is that you suggested that, that there is a political overtone in the ritual bar mitzvah, and he objects to this. Can you substantiate your statement? 
the girl, if you went to any bar mitzvah, there's a lecture after the young man and before the young man. There's a lecture of the young man's commitment. It is a lecture in my commitment. Every uh, child, if the rabbi is sitting here and tell me that the rabbi doesn't get up and get a lecture about the bar mitzvah, and the youngster doesn't pick out a section of the Torah to read, and that the youngster doesn't get up there and make a commitment to the, to the, to the Jewish community, then I don't know what form of Judaism. I don't know if he's reform, reconstructionist, uh, uh, conservative, or orthodox, or whatever else there may be. But it would be rare to me not to go to a bar mitzvah and not hear the rabbi mention in the commitment to the Jewish people and to Israel. If, in fact, that, that rabbi is, uh, unless the rabbi is anti-Israel. Right. Yes, I, I, I think there are a number of things that must be made clear. And the, the level of uh, misstatements in this are also quite clear. Uh, uh, you just repeated, as appeared in the transcript, the statement that the, uh, the bar mitzvah boy uh, picks out his selection uh, for the morning. Uh, but it's rather common knowledge and Jewish practice of... Uh, uh, centuries, uh, that there is a set cycle of the reading of the Torah and the Haftorah, and uh, bar mitzvah children under uh, no circumstances uh, are in a position to pick and choose their Torah portions. Uh, their portions are part of the set calendar uh, prescription of which portions of the Torah progressively are to be read on a given uh, Shabbat, a Saturday morning. Uh, so that uh, even on this factual level, there, there's a disturbing lack of accuracy uh, well, in, in, in the presentation. Wait, now, European Jews don't run Judaism. You don't make Judaism. In the, among the Palashas, among the, the, um, the, 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 the Jews from Kashim Jews, we pick. You see, Judaism is run by you. You don't set the standard for Judaism. So now we're in the process of, of uh, a double standard of, of selection. You have indicated in your transcript that this is what occurs in American synagogues it does too. by indicating uh, that uh, Jewish children make this statement of loyalty to Israel. Yet when I uh, uh, clarify your misstatement about uh, how Torah readings are selected, you tell me, well, there are other practices aside from the Wait, practice now. here, which may indeed be true, one example being the triennial cycle of the reading of the Torah. Oh, yeah. But then you can't take the American example, and then selectively learn from it uh, something that you choose from the another context. The, child, the Jewish child doesn't read the entire sermon of the area, other period. He does select a section within that period. That's all I said. He, the child doesn't read the entire book or the entire thing that is going to be said on that particular Shabbat. The child has a section within it he reads. And there are indeed many synagogues, especially in the Orthodox community, in which the entire section is indeed uh, the entire parasha. So then you're admitting is, that there is, is divergence right. between the Jewish synagogue right here in America? Within the prescripted calendar structure Who of readings. I do, all I said is that the child is allowed to pick out. You're saying in the Orthodox, in certain Orthodox, not all, the child must read the entire thing. I'm saying that the child is allowed to pick out a section. What is wrong with that? According to your transcript, and I won't take the time to find the exact words unless it's uh, required, you make a statement that the child may pick out sections and you use the term Isaiah or from whatever. D uh, depending on the period of time in which we are. Depending if Isaiah is indeed part of the text. Uh, who said not? I mean, you, you just wanted, in, in other words, I said exactly what you're saying, that the child is allowed to pick out that section. Let's say that we are reading the book of Isaiah now. We're reading the book of Hosea. The child is allowed to pick out, out Isaiah a certain section. Or the child is allowed in Hosea if we are reading at that particular time. Because all the children don't make bar mitzvah in the same month and at the same time. One, sh one, one should be clear, however, that that's partially accurate because part liturgically of what a child is expected to read uh, or participate in, if possible, is the reading from the Torah itself. Indeed, the reading from the Haftorah uh, is a significantly later development precisely because if a child is a bar mitzvah, is a son of the commandments, then one of his first public possible acts is being called up to the public reading of the Torah. Right. And uh, it's by this uh, act that uh, uh, his reaching adulthood uh, is publicly declared. If I may, however, go on to, well, you to, to, to what I think. <laughs> well, wait, let's settle this before we move on. And then all I'll right, be happy because to there were you... some other points oh, that yes, I think we're, should we're be, uh, try to get into all of that. Your response, Dr. Ben. Uh, the point is, everyone I stated is adulthood. The question is not when does he do this. 
if he's a man or a child, because at some, I already stated, the Torah would be similar in essence to the, conf uh, to the um, uh, uh, confirmation of the Christians. When the child comes of a certain age and take up his manhood, he's, in order to be able to sit in the minion, to sit in the uh, official congregation as a young man, he has to come and go for the bar mitzvah before he could sit in the minion. They, 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 you know, okay. now, that, 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 he doesn't deny that. All I'm saying, and what he can't refute, He's, and he's saying about uh, later changes. I don't care what the changes, if it's later or earlier. The fact is that they do it. It's a very curious kind of uh, contextual oversimplification here. On the one hand, uh, Dr. Ben uh, correctly points out certain instances of uh, Egyptian historical input in what we today call uh, the uh, religion of the Hebrews and later Judaism. Uh, and no one can deny the role of uh, cultural and historical context. On the other hand, uh, given it would seem your political need to view all through the African perspective, you completely uh, ignore uh, the experience of the Code of Hammurabi, of the Mesopotamian sources of law, which appear significantly modified in later Torah development. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that, on the one hand, it is a strange scholarly position to argue that historical context must be accounted for in the development of Judaism, which I would accept, and then argue, however, that only that political context, which is useful to your present political view, uh, uh, is to be uh, noted and is acceptable. As I read the transcript, as I excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, as I read the transcript here, uh, there is a, a comment here that uh, that says, and permit me to paraphrase loosely, that Judaism and all of Judaism and the Jewish people come from Egypt, therefore they are African, uh, and therefore there is a statement later on that uh, many blacks do not understand that they in, are indeed Jews. Now that raises. Uh, now, that, that raises to us a very curious question. Why the constant need to inject a racial quota into a diverse historical context, which we would acknowledge, but yet on the other hand, as we sit here having watched uh, Operation Moses and the uh, ingathering of uh, Ethiopian Jews into Israel, why then the need to define by race as what is essentially authentic in Judaism strikes us as a contradiction that at least can possibly be interpreted in terms of current political context, All but right. certainly not by history. All right. All Dr. right. Ben. I'm glad that you brought that last point, so I work from the, from the last forward or backwards. Isn't it strange that just yesterday that the Jews in America found out that they are black Jews? Isn't it strange also that you don't consider us Jews because when we go to Israel, you're still demanding that we must, quote unquote, reconvert. Who said we converted in the first place? Who said, no, uh, what right have European Jews, who don't belong there either, have a right to tell us and to carry us to a shameful... I'm sorry, uh, European Jews who uh, what? No, who don't, don't, don't have no, a... No, more, any more than we do. Because the Russian Jews come there, many of them not circumcised. Many of them never have a, a, a mitzvah, And we had to go, nobody asked them to reconvert. We had to go there and a fast call, a re, uh, re, um, uh, um, circumcision uh, and the uh, um, you know I wanted to use the Hebrew word but at the moment and we're supposed to go through all that next thing rabbi how come my uncle Tamarat Emanuel came here in 1935 to raise money when Italy invaded Ethiopia we were five million when we left we were fifty well five fifty thousand the Jewish community in America refused denied that we existed up to now in Israel you have uh, uh, two grand rabbi at least the Sephardic Grand Rabbi and the Ashkenazi Grand Rabbi, the European Grand Rabbi, that re refused to recognize that we even Jews. Only the Sephardic Grand, Grand Rabbi started with Rab uh, Obadiah Yosef when he was the chief rabbi. Now let's come go back. So that it's a farce about Israel telling us to come there for whatever the reason. In that, in that, Israel to this day, from 1947, have in the Knesset a petition for the acceptance of Jews from Ethiopia, the right to return. To this day, it has not been approved. It has still been tabled every, uh, every year. Now, so that you, 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 you try to show the liberality of 
white American Jews when it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist at all. Because if you're saying that you're bringing us back, then we should go back as Jews, not as something that you're going to make us over there. Who gives you the authority to say who is a Jew and who isn't a, isn't a Jew? Uh, you talk about the, the, my, my desire for the political uh, 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 aristocracy, my political sense. Well, it was obvious that no one questions European Jews. Am I to believe that European Jews don't have a white politics here? When blacks move into the white neighbor, into the, a Jewish neighborhood, white Jewish neighborhood, doesn't the white Jew move like the white Christian? I mean, doesn't the white Jew have white flight to the, to the suburb? Now, so, as a Jew, are you saying that I should behave as a Jew, period, in the United States, that means white Jew, in the United States, uh, and run from the blacks? And when I come here, my acceptance in Judaism isn't the same as when you come. When you come, if you came, you came as a white Jew, and the white Jews, and you deal with whites. Now, I'm a black Jew, isolated from Judaism by virtue of that, because of my blackness. When I go into a synagogue, most synagogue I go into, the first thing they ask, tell me, and I ask, so I'm Jew. When you become Jew, did your parents convert? When? You don't ask a white person walk into the synagogue and say that. Go back about the Jews learning the Hanarabi Code. When you talk about Hanarabi Code, you're talking about 2000 BC just the other day, historically speaking. The negative, con the concept of one God didn't come from Moses, Mohana Rabbi. It I can even preach one God before Moses was born. Um, the, 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 the Aaron and about there being African. If you're born in America, you are an American Jew, wouldn't you say? Now, where was Aaron born? Where was uh, 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 Moses born? And uh, Sarah? Uh, uh, Aaron's sister and, and all of them, uh, um, uh, uh, Miriam. Where were all of this supposed to be happening? Before the Jews come in contact again as a group, not Moses, not Ab uh, uh, Abraham and his little uh, family, from Abraham uh, and excluding Joseph, from then on, for according to Torah, for approximately 400 years, everything the Jews learned was in Egypt, everything. Because it, from the time of Joseph, the Exodus, uh, uh, Genesis ends, and Moses died. And there came a time when Moses di uh, uh, er, um, Joseph died. Because of this bad period that came, who knew not Joseph. From then on, we had to hear about the plight of the Jewish people and so forth. But before that, by the time of Potiphar, all the way down to the Exodus, isn't it everything that you learned was in there? It was no Hanarabi code. Right. And I said the basic foundation of Judaism, one God and all that, came out of Africa. It's Egypt is still there, not in the Middle East. Time, time, time for another break. We will continue with our discussion, our modest discussion, right after this. Let's press on. Let's, please. Uh, a number of points. Uh, again, we're into this historical selectivity and at the risk of sounding as if I'm pushing Mesopotamia uh, today. Uh, the reality is, of course, that uh, both the archaeological and the literary evidence of uh, uh, such areas as Ebla and others clearly uh, illustrate that uh, a proto-monotheism existed in the Mesopotamian area uh, centuries and centuries before uh, the, the Hebrews. Uh, some scholars have even attempted to identify one of the Mesopotamian names of this uh, god as Eloah, and in that way try to learn from it the Hebrew term Elohim. And I merely identify this as one scholarly view. Again, I, I wouldn't want to deny for a moment that Egypt is part of the cultural mix, and therefore Africa, as, as uh, you would want to make the political point. But to se selectively uh, ignore all other historical factors to then be able to make a political point uh, uh, is, is not to be dismissed as a cry of anti-Semitism when it's raised, uh, but is to be called for inaccuracy in the historical record, uh, and one has uh, an absolute right to do that when that inaccuracy then feeds it to contemporary politics. But if I would like, but, but if wait, I could respond right. to the Ethiopian issue. No, wait, no, because I'm going to answer you that point first. Then you could go to the Ethiopian issue because All that's right. a big issue too. Mm -hmm. uh, you try to uh, throw over that anti-Semitism slipping right there. Mm -hmm. Even when a Jew disagrees with a Jew, it becomes anti-Semitic. 
By the way, I, I hope that I, I hope that you, uh, I hope that you would agree that the common statement in America among Jews is that if your mother is Jewish, then you're Jewish. Would you agree to that? According to Jewish law. Okay. And if you make it better, if your father is Jewish and your mother Jewish, then you're no, ultra Jewish. Excuse me, one's father has nothing I to says, do with I the said, status I said, of I Jewish added law. That for extra that, measure. Right, but that has no, no I didn't say it does. I said it, in terms I, I didn't say it status. does. Don't, pick, don't be peculiar. I mean, we're dealing with the issue. I said, well, okay, my mother is, and so that make me yes. Uh, that is me. That. Yes, ma'am. Okay, fine. So then to call me anti Semitic, as a Jew practicing, went through all the rituals like the lady who probably did on yourself, then it would mean that I strongly disagree with the teachings that what you just stated, for example. Then I said to you, using the Torah itself, on the statement of the Torah that, uh, that Abraham came from the city of Ur in the nation of Chaldea, which was at the time, since we're using by history, ruled by Africans, the, it, a joint army that went all the way to India. Now you said scholars. There's only one scholar that made that remark that I know of, and that's the one from the Stern Institute over there on Lex, uh, Lexington Avenue. Uh, now, secondly, there may be continuation of those scholars coming out of European context. What you fail to understand, Rabbi, is that European Jews are Europeans and think as Europeans and act as Europeans. African Jews, on the other hand, are being asked not to act as Africans and an African Jewish scholar, African scholarship. And thus you're telling me with the scholars. Now let me go. I all right, are you finished no. addressing his, his No, the point? last part you of his point. You got more? All right. Last part of his, his point. The period of time in which we're speaking, and unfortunately, Torah doesn't give dates, but the period of time in which we're talking about Avram, Avram or Abraham isn't born until around 1775 BCE, before the Christian era. That would put him around the 13th century, a 13th dynasty, Egyptian 13th dynasty, Ethiopian Turkey, the, the dynasty of the Nile Valley as a whole, because it's not only Egypt. Egypt is the zenith of a culture that goes way back, because the ancient Egyptians themselves said, we came from the beginning of the Nile where God happy dwell. All of those things. For instance, look at Rabbi, the myth that the Jews built the pyramids. You know that's a myth, yet it's taught, probably you say it yourself, Koch gets up there and he goes and stands up on the pyramid, Begin gets it up there, and you know pretty well that the last pyramid was built before the birth of the first Jew, Abraham. Now, if I said that, I'll be anti-Semitic. All right. The, in, in the interest of fairness, Dr. Ben, let's, let's hear what uh, Rabbi Seltzer has to say. Uh, what's disturbing is simply the, the level of misunderstanding of what we're saying is that uh, the scholarly view that I identified and which uh, you then identified as a Stern College view, uh, Stern College is part of Yeshiva University, right an orthodox institution. My background is in the reform movement. I assure you that uh, much of what I've suggested in terms of biblical scholarship would be totally rejected and considered unacceptable by the orthodox community uh, as uh, representing non-rabbinic analysis of Torah. <laughs> Therefore, to dismiss my remarks as uh, being represented by Stern College raises the question of, uh, of what kind of comprehension we have here of, of scholarship and, uh, and indeed, uh, the, uh, the pluralism within the Jewish community. And that leads me to the point I want to make. Good point. Uh, in the, in the uh, uh, transcripts and in your remarks now, there's a tendency to speak of all Jews in the broadest context, so that you began with the Ethiopian issue by speaking about Israelis, then switched to white American Jews. And as I listened to you, um, I heard a constant tendency to put everything in the category of white, European, versus uh, black, Sephardic, Oriental. And again, I ask myself... That's the way it is. And again, I ask myself the question, <coughs> the state of Israel, which has a population today which is 60% Sephardic, right. non-European... Who are at the bottom of the social ladder... Excuse me, please, I listen to you. Uh, which a, a population which is 60% uh, non-European... Uh, a population coming from uh, the Middle East and the Oriental countries. Uh, it is certainly a political charge, which we hear constantly and is used constantly, that Israel is a, uh, a white European colonialist bastion in the middle of uh, uh, an Arab third world part of the world. Uh, but the reality is that Israel today increasingly takes on the Levantine quality of the area in which it's in, precisely because of the population. 
side point, but 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 let me proceed. But, 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 but let side me point and don't want me to but answer let me and proceed, then, no, let me answer please. that and then you no, proceed. No, sir. I no, wait. Now you don't run the program. Can I answer him? No. Sir, all right. Let, let, point, let, no. Let, 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 let I, me interject. Absolutely. Let me interject. Let me interject. Let me give you one minute to press your point forward. And then Dr. Ben can. Con I must say that we're, the time is evaporating. Fine. And so that is then, my concern. So then it's, a, it's necessary <coughs> one, to proceed. One minute. Well, I shall try it one minute. Um, again, this attempt to say that only black Jews experience uh, difficulty in Israel. There are a number of, uh, frankly, inaccuracies in this. When Soviet Jews began to come to Israel, there was precisely the same kind of questioning raised by the rabbinate. Since the rabbinic establishment and authorities were uh, in disarray in the Soviet Union, were indeed these people who were coming Jews under Orthodox law. It caused political problems. Ultimately, it was worked out as the issue with the Ethiopians is a problem, will be worked out. To characterize this on a racial basis is totally unworthy of what is indeed going on today in Israel. Dr. Ben? He speaks of the multiracial characteristic of Israel. But he didn't say that the multiracial characteristic isn't, um, isn't visible in the control in Israel. Israel is controlled by a European, European-American, and British factor of white Judaism. He doesn't want me to deal with this reality. I've been there umpteen times. Is that I've true, seen it Rabbi for myself. I would give you two quick answers to that. That historically, yes, because of the nature of the earlier immigration. Present At day. this point in time, given the past election results in which Likud, which was heavily representative of the Sephardic community, and labor, which has its base in the European community, ended up in essential parity. The reality is that power is increasingly shifting from total European control to indeed what is considered a parity between the two communities. Well, it would, it would seem to be a simple question, Rabbi Seltzer. Do Jews who are European or white control Israel, or do Jews who are African control Israel? No, it's not that simple because it we're isn't. dealing with, no, not at all, because we're dealing with the question of process. And the question of process simply indicates that the initial migration of population out of which the state of Israel was established was European. The governmental structures were created by these people. Immediately after the creation of the state, over half a million Sephardic Jews from the Middle East, from North Africa, were brought into the state while it was involved in a fight for independence. These people took the obvious number of years to be able to function uh, effectively on all levels of government, in all levels of Israeli society. Time is a necessary factor in life, but as of this point today, one can say without any hesitation that the non-European Sephardic community wields tremendous power in the state of Israel who today. Who is the dominant and power? Is on, who is a dominant power? Again, I would indicate that by the last election, in which both Likud and Labor ended up in what is essentially a dead heat, one can learn from this that there is no one group in power anymore. Dr. Ben? Uh, uh, the rabbi is, is, the rabbi is saying to me that if I went to Israel or you went to Israel, that most of the people in government, the ambassadors traveling all over, are not European, European American and British Jews. Am I to believe that that's what he's saying, that there's an equal division of power? I, I can't think that the rabbi will stay there and say this and give a, a, this kind of a evasive answer to the question. The European and European-American and uh, British Jews still dominate the politics of Israel, still do dominate the economy of Israel. And is he saying to me that these people are now welcome? My point to him is, regardless of what rabbis may have said, did they demand that, uh, 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 that um, the, the Jews from uh, Russia go through uh, uh, a new halakha? Do they uh, re uh, reconversion? Do they demand a brisk? They're a, not. A, a, wait, no, a brisk, a, so, a circumcision. Such for, were the demands. Them? Such were exactly was it the demands. Was it carried through? And just as, and the parallel is a very important one, just as politically, the intent of the Orthodox, let me finish, please. Just as politically, the intent of the Orthodox rabbinic establishment could not be considered acceptable, and these demands were ultimately dropped 
with Soviet Jews, so one finds that as the Ethiopian Jewish community grows, the rabbinate itself has been forced to back down, and I think it is a very clear statement right, that most okay. Israeli that opinion gotta, gotta would, it, would accept, no, would accept the Jews. That is Jewish not Jews. true, because up to now... You got, no, wait a minute now. I got a cut for, for a commercial break. All right. I know you're, you're hot, <laughs> both hot. Hot program. Hey, this is the last segment you can't run over, and I'm going to chop you if you do. We can't resolve your philosophical, your political, your historical, your ideological differences clearly this hour. But maybe we can address ourselves to tone and intent. Obviously, the letter that was written by the ADL uh, objects to the tone and suggests that there may be some premeditated, sinister, injurious intent to Dr. Ben's remark for political reasons. And perhaps we can, you can clarify that, and perhaps Dr. Ben can rebut and answer, and maybe perhaps we can clarify and heal this rift. As we read the transcript and as, as we discussed today, we see much in your remarks that is reflected in third world political statements uh, in the UN, in other forum. Uh, the fact that you are indeed Jewish in no way changes the content of these remarks and the political context in which we see them. From our point of view, as Ethiopians were starving and are starving, Israel was the only country that offered the kind of aid to physically bring black Ethiopians out and indeed, it's the only example of a nation of Caucasians, to use the term that appears frequently here, of bringing in whites, uh, bringing blacks in dignity as citizens. To begin to turn it around says to us, we begin to hear the same kind of third world, radical, political kind of rhetoric, which is directed towards the United Nations, towards Israel and the United Nations, which we hear in so many other uh, forums. This is what we respond to, this okay. willingness to identify Jews and Judaism with colonialism, whites, repression, and having read some of your other material in addition to this, I must say that it's a theme that strikes me as pervasive and something that we find unacceptable in a public forum. All right. Uh, number one, you spoke very much about um, generalized statement. You just said that the Ethiopians are starving and you bring it out. Isn't it a fact that you're talking about only, Ethiopia has about 40 million people. You're talking about five miles from the border with Sudan in South, where the starvation situation developed. Isn't it also a fact that the Palestinians, the Ethiopians, would better Israel, our people were not particularly at that spot? Isn't it a fact that the United, same United Nations you call on found that we, many of our community was ready to bring people out? And you talk about the only nation to help. Isn't it also a fact that there are almost every nation in the world in Ethiopia giving assistance to people who are hungry on the northern b uh, borders of Ethiopia? Are you suggesting now, that wait, it would have been better wait, for now, Israel let me let me go ahead. to in no let sense me go ahead. save black you lives? Talk about, Is this what you talk you're about, suggesting? Wait, now, you talk about this. No. If Israel had bring them, I was saving us for the reason that you indicated or tried to indicate, yes. Well, how is it that all of a sudden that we are saved, but we wind up in the army and we, we're, we're, we're dying from starvation? We wind up in people's house cleaning, and you know, Falasha women, Falasha never let their women, this is one thing against our principle, to work as domestic in anybody's house. We're doing that now. Why didn't you mention the, the four Falashas last, uh, two, three weeks ago that committed suicide over this in Israel? Why didn't you mention the protest between Israel? Why didn't you mention the dialogue between Israel and Ethiopia that the Falashas mean that they want to go back to Ethiopia and there's a dialogue about the, bring, and the Ethiopian government say, you brought, you took them, bring them back? So Why the saving mention... of lives by the state of Israel of oh, Jews is another example of racism, oh, wait now, according wait to now. you. If you could say it that way, okay, but if you get cheap labor, you don't have to worry about the lies. And that is the purpose at which the state of Israel brought the only Ethiopian thing community for when we were labor. Wait, no. That is unworthy of a public statement. Uh, okay, it is. But when we were dying from Mussolini extermination, it is typical of the behavior of European American Jews. You don't want me to say that. Rabbi, you probably live in a racist society yourself. I couldn't probably walk any night. 
You, want, you don't want me Had to deal Israel with the Israel not initiated the Operation Moses, I suspect you would, would have been not, among the first who would have said, you see how racist the state of me, Israel not is I think for the not responding to the plight of Jews, the even though they're black. It's the biggest mistake. But now Rabbi, you say that Rabbi, even though they're black, the it's a racist you response. You the courtesy of listening. It's outrageous. I listen to you. It's absolutely but outrageous. You don't think that I feel like you're outrageous? No. My point is this, that a, 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 a nation that said we don't exist, you know, with the, with the contrition of Israel, the th thousands upon thousands of Israelis li leaving Israel constantly, you need to replenish that, com that, that community. You have an Arab situation, and do don't deal with me the third world, because I'm not a member of the third world, I'm a member of the first world. You know, Jinzantipa's voice, he was long before Adam and Eve, and it's found in Africa. Lucy is found in Ethiopia, and it's 3.2 million years. You see, you want me to go along with a dialogue that is, suits you as a European Jew, but doesn't suit me as an African Jew. And you assume that my African Jewishness should supersede my Africanness. No way, Rabbi, because you want it both ways. You want to be a European Jew, benefiting from being a European, benefiting from being a Jew, and that I sat by, sat by and listened to it, and then call it anti-Semitic. You may have difficulty, but the record will show that I sit here as an American Jew. That's right. That will be my and definition of how Jew. you choose to define me in whatever racial or political terms you have the need is your business. Bye. But I reject it's over. it totally. I've got to cut you. I thank you both. Thank you for expressing your opinion so, uh, so openly. Yes. Uh, she asked if I would uh, assume the responsibility of uh, responding in the name of ADL. All right. And that's what brings me here. And she sent you the transcript? Yes, indeed. All right. What are your problems with the comments that were made by Dr. Ben in, in the program? From the perspective of the ADL, we have numerous difficulties with uh, the statements that were made. Uh, and I suspect we'll have an opportunity as the program goes on to discuss specifics. But in an overall general sense, uh, as we study the transcript, Dr. Ben's remarks uh, were full of clearly factual errors, uh, but the kind of errors which were not just matters of detail, but were matters that would lead one uh, down the path of the charge of dual loyalty, which, as Carolista indicated in her, le uh, her letter, has been a classic uh, charge of the anti-Semite uh, throughout the generations. The statement uh, that appears in the transcript that was made by uh, Dr. Ben, uh, that a Jewish child uh, makes a statement of allegiance uh, uh, to Israel uh, and uh, makes a statement of allegiance greater than even to his Americanism, is so patently false and outrageous as to make one wonder why such a statement would be made. I must tell you that before uh, joining the staff of the Anti-Defamation League, I served as a congregational pulpit rabbi for nine years and officiated at countless numbers of bar and bat mitzvahs in my congregations. And I must tell you that never have I heard a, a, uh, a more inaccurate statement as to what goes on. Uh, the transcript uh, uh, indicates that uh, a Jewish child uh, commits himself that there shall never be another Holocaust, uh, takes upon himself political obligations, takes upon himself the responsibility to fight for the uh, state of Israel. The reality is that in the Jewish tradition, bar mitzvah means a son of the commandments. And a boy becomes a bar mitzvah, a son of the commandments, upon his 13th birthday. A girl in America, the practice tends to be at 12. According to Talmudic law, she reaches her majority at 12. That's portions of the letter. Well, I answered Carol Lister, who wrote that letter. She's regional director of the ADL, by inviting her to appear on Like It Is to confront Dr. Ben. Well, the ADL has accepted, and so has Dr. Ben. We'll get things right underway in a moment. Professor Yosef Ben Yekinen, or Dr. Ben as he is popularly known, is an Egyptologist, the author of innumerable books on African history and Egyptology, and has taught for several years at Cornell University. Rabbi Arthur Seltzer is director of the Long Island Regional Office of the Anti-Defamation League and resides in Great Neck, Long Island. Welcome to Like It Is. Thank you. Maybe we can start with you, Rabbi Seltzer. Uh, did you see the program? No, I did not see the program, but I have studied the transcripts. Okay. How did you come to uh, this chair today? How did that happen, since you didn't see the program? 
you were called by the New York office of the ADL and made aware of the program? Yes, Carol Lister, who originally wrote to you, very much wanted to appear, but because of a conflict of uh, schedule, simply false and frankly perverse statement of what it means for a Jewish community to celebrate a religious ceremony of passage. The answer, we might suggest, is the next sentence which indicates the charge of, of dual loyalties. Uh, this statement was made many, many times throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the, the entire transcript. It led in one of his remarks to a statement in discussing about Israel that uh, now we understand about the genocide of the uh, Hebrews as they entered the land. Uh, the commitment of a Jewish child to fight for Israel reflects the genocidal entrance of the children of Israel uh, into the land in biblical times. Not only does that have a distinctly political ring to it, uh, it is again an unacceptable statement if only from the point of view of biblical scholarship, which very clearly has mm -hmm. come to understand uh, that uh, those sections that speak of a victorious march of, a, uh, of, the, of an army of onslaught into the land are certainly later sections of the text, 12 and a half. The bar mitzvah ceremony most specifically indicates that a Jewish child, a minor, now has reached that stage in life where he is considered an adult Jew in terms of his religious and communal responsibilities. Any statements that are made of commitment by bar and bat mitzvah uh, children or adults as they enter the adult world in the Jewish community are statements of acceptance of the yoke of the commandments of all that comes with uh, Jewish life, personal, family, uh, communal, and under no circumstances are there statements of political content. But if I could uh, perhaps clarify this a bit more. Uh, Dr. Ben then indicated in the uh, uh, transcript, as it appears, that this very statement of loyalty that's made to the state of Israel uh, is the seedbed out of which comes the charge of dual loyalties. Uh, and uh, we ask ourselves in the Anti-Defamation League the following question. Why would anyone offer such a blatant